Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 10. Good to see you today. Mark chapter 10. When I went to the conference, and you've already gotten a little taste of it, every preacher, uh, he, he looks for ways to improve. Uh, he really does. And when, when you go to a conference like that, your natural incl inclination is competition. Uh, and it ought not be, uh, but your natural inclination is, is competition. You, you go there and you say, am I going up to standard? I, 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 are we doing okay? And I told a Sunday school class earlier as I'm sitting there, and I just enjoy church. I, I really do. I, I, I do. I, if he would preach for two hours, wouldn't make me mad at all. As long as he's preaching God's word, I, I'm good with it. Just keep preaching. I, I'm fine. There were two messages in the morning, then a bunch of sessions, two messages in the evening, a bunch of sessions. I mean, it was just a lot of fun, a lot of information. I really, really enjoyed that. By the way, Jarrett says hello, and, and he cares about you, loves you very much, misses the daylights out of you. He's doing really, really good. I got to eat with him. Just to let you know I got to eat with him for uh, three nights in a row just to let you know I got to be with Jarrett so anyhow so uh, the choir singing and I told the, uh, the folks just this morning choir singing and Brother Fugit says after they got done with their song, it was wonderful, good, good music. By the way, uh, they sang two of the songs we always sing here. It, it, it's so fun. I love that. And uh, you say, what's that? What's that? I, I'm, I, I'm happy about it. Just get, let me be happy. So anyway, so uh, I'm sitting there, and, and Brother Fugit uh, yells out, do number 11. <laughs> and it cracked me up because... I know a church that does that. I, I, it's just wonderful. But uh, I, I loved it uh, because uh, we're cut of the same cloth. And, and let me explain that a little bit. When you use this as your standard, when you use, and I want you to understand, this is not about me. It, it's not about Pastor Skyver. It's, not, it's about the foundation that we use. When you use the foundation that we use, churches are going to be cut of the same cloth. Amen? They're going to have bus routes because that's the Bible tells us to go out and get them. That's what we're going to have. I'm excited to let you know that I enjoyed the service because it was like I was in Bethel. Maybe a little bit bigger, but it was like I was in Bethel. Preaching was probably better, but I was in Bethel. Amen? I enjoyed being there. And, I, and I, I want you to read this with me, and, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to brag on you for a little bit, uh, and, and it is what it is, so enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to be nice for the vast majority of this message, I'm going to be very nice. Um, <clears throat> and then when I turn mean, I mean to everybody, including myself. I'm, I'm giving you a little precursor, so lock the doors, you're going to enjoy the first part, and then it's going to hurt a little bit at the end, right before the invitation. <laughs> Amen. So I'm giving you the opportunity to sleep for the first few if you want to, but wake up at the end. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to read a few verses. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10, verse 17. So good to see you today. Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. And when he was gone, it's Jesus, was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus answers this way. And please understand this as you're reading the Bible. Nothing ever occurred to Christ. He knows what to say because he's God. He, he didn't say something wrong. You're going to see here. Why, why, why would Jesus? Because Jesus knows. Amen. Okay. So this man comes running uh, unto the good master. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, thou, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Oh, why would he say that, preacher? <laughs> because he's God, and he wants the guy to know that. He knows. Amen? Okay. Thou knowest the commandments, Jesus says. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. That's not all of them, by the way. I want you to notice. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Been pretty good, pretty good guy. I'm ahead of the game. 
And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, I want you to see this, loved him. He loved him, and there's something he needs to hear. He loved him, and there's something he needs to know. Amen? He said unto him, One thing thou lackest. One thing. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come... Take up the cross and follow me. I, I find this interesting. The cross had not come yet. Take up the cross and follow me. This is the fella, and he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's go ahead and pray. Brother Jordan, lead us in prayer. Amen. You may be seated. Well, you notice a few things about the young man, or man. I don't know whether he's young or not, but man. If he was older, he probably wouldn't be running. Uh, anyways, the, the man, I want you to notice a few things about him. We, we always seem to skip to the end, but I want you to at least notice the posture here. Number one, he comes running. Now, glory to God, I would to God regular Christians would come running to Christ. I mean, I would to God that we would stop looking out for the world's answer and go ahead and run to Christ for the answer. I got news for you. As I study this Bible, uh, the only answer is always in here. It, there's never a time uh, when the answer cannot be found in its glorious pages. This is the love letter Jesus Christ gave to us. The answer is contained herein. However, sometimes we don't want to do <laughs> what's required for the answer. This man comes running. I'm glad that when he came running, he then stopped and then kneeled to Christ. I'm glad that he recognized that this fella is getting a lot of things done in this land. This fella is doing some great miracles. This fella is something special. This fella is something great. I ought to kneel to him. I'm glad that we as Christians see how good God is. I don't believe there's one person in this room doesn't realize the goodness of God. Because how many are saved in here today? Boy, that was overwhelming. I'm glad. When we get to heaven, you are going to be shocked at how loud it is there. When we, when, I hope I get the chance to preach in heaven. I can't wait to hear the amens that come from the crowd that's there. How many in here are saved today? Amen. That's better. You're not an ecumenical church. You're in a Baptist church. You're allowed to say amen. amen. So, uh, by the way, uh, the more you say amen, the quicker I preach. Amen. I knew Miss Josel would be the loudest. So anyways, so he kneeled to Christ. A great posture to have uh, when speaking with the, pre the Prince of Peace. A, a, a great posture to have when you're talking to the King of Kings. A great posture to have. Hey, listen, I understand you can talk to him as a friend. Uh, he's the friend that's sticking closer than a brother. But we also must see him as God. When we look into his refining fire eyes, I think our posture is going to be a little bit different than, Hey, Daddy-O, how's it going? He's not the man upstairs. He's God. Doesn't mean you'd be afraid of him. He's your heavenly father. But I wouldn't tell my dad that's here. Hey, daddy-o. How good would Pastor Skyer have handled it if I would said, hey, bucko, how you doing? <laughs> Number three, he came running. He kneeled to Christ. He had a real question that gave him concern. Hey, this eternal life thing, I've heard tell about it. I wonder how I get it. I want you to know something right now. As we go through this message, you're going to understand this. Eternal life is real. No, no wait a minute. <laughs> I know we talk about it. But may I tell you that when you take your, if you're saved in here today, when you take your last breath here, you're going to go to heaven. Heaven is real and it lasts forever. There's not going to be a break in the action. There's not going to be a time when you say, oh boy, this is boring. There's not going to be a time when you wish to be out of there. You're going to go to heaven and you're going to love it. For eternity. Eternity is not how long it took for the Browns to win a game. Eternity is way longer than that. 
Eternity is forever. In other words, the, pun- the time clock that you're punching is non-existent. Why? There's no time there. Can't wrap our head around it. And this young man or man decides to say, hey, Jesus, how do, what do I have to do here to get eternal life? Can I help you? Everybody's asking that question. How do you know that? How many religions are there? Do you know what every one of them has at their basis? Eternity. Well, what are we going to do to get eternity? Church of Christ, get baptized, you get eternity. Baptism has nothing to do with it. Mormons, oh, bless God, you, you, if you're good while you're here, 144,000 of you are going to go to heaven. And none of them are going to be women. Study their doctrine. The 144,000 they talk about in the scripture are virgin men. Ladies, I'd be upset. <laughs> equal rights, equal rights. You study the religions of the world. They're all going towards one thing, and that's the one thing Jesus paid for. There's only one way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's talking about himself. This young man or man knew, hey, man, I've got to kneel before, and I've got to find out how do I get eternal life. We need to tell folks how to get it. This man at least found himself the right posture. Uh, This man found himself the right person. Uh, This man found himself the right question. It gave him concern. Jesus proposes a hypothetical to him. Now, wait a minute. Bring this man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a good man. Why are you calling me good? There's none good. But God, bringing to his mind, well, wait a minute, he must be. This is what Jesus is trying to get him to understand. To come to the Lord, you must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, understand this. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe that you don't seek him till you get saved. Now, understand this. Before that, you might say, oh, preacher, I don't understand that. He's seeking you. Jesus is coming to you. Jesus has knocked on your heart door somewhere, and you ended up accepting him as Savior. That's just the beginning and end of it. As lost folk, we're not seeking him. He's seeking us. He knocks on our heart door. How's that possible? I don't know. Ask him when we get there. But he's seeking. He sought me. Amen. He sought me and he bought me, and I'm so glad he did. He tells us, look, if you're going to understand this situation, you must understand that I am God. Okay? So, we move on from there. Jesus goes over some commandments. And by the way, the ten, even if you said all ten, those ten aren't the only ones. There's commandments all through the scripture. Those just happen to be the ones we turn to all the time. And if we could keep those, well, we'd sure be good. But we can't keep those. Those are a schoolmaster. Those are given to show that we're sinners. So he says these, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Well, if you could keep those, you'd be a pretty good fella. He says, you got them. I've kept these from my youth. Now, I love this because as I'm reading this, And I'll get to us here in a minute. As I'm reading this, Jesus is so, he's so awesome, okay? Because Jesus throws him a softball. Jesus says to him, these commandments, knowing that that young man kept those. Don't act like Jesus didn't know that. He gave him commandments that that guy has kept. Amen? Amen? He's not going to look back at Jesus. If he's going to come to him as God, how do I get eternal? How do I inherit eternal life? I, I, but, but I, you know, I kept about half of those, but I'm going to say I kept them all. I'm sure he's figuring that Jesus probably knows that. And Jesus, not wanting the conversation to go in a wrong direction, this is me reading. I look at this and say, well, Jesus knew that this guy had not committed any problems here. Amen? Look, look I know we're all sinners. 
okay? But we're not sinners in everything. Come on, you can come here and say, oh, bless God. Every time I come in this church, I walk away discouraged. Understand this, be encouraged because Jesus Christ knows those sins. He's speaking through me to help you to understand that that's forgiven. Move on. Amen. What an encouraging thing to know that Jesus knows I'm a sinner, loves me, forgives me, and I can move on. All right. Okay. So he comes up. This man had lived a decent life. He didn't commit any of these problems. But then Jesus makes a statement. But there's one thing that thou lackest. One thing. Now, I want to help you out here. Brother Jim, it doesn't matter what that one thing is. I'm going to submit to you that this man had a problem with riches. But that does not mean having riches is your problem. I've heard this preached before. Bless God, if we would sell all that we have, we'd be closer to Christ. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. What has that got to do with anything? Russell Anderson did not sell everything he had. He did an awful lot for Jesus Christ. Wealthy man did an awful lot for Jesus Christ. If Bill Gates would get saved and start helping the cause of Christ, I don't believe riches would be his problem. Help me now. But with this fella, riches were the problem. Right? How do I know that? Look at the reaction. The reaction is, oh, man. Read the Bible. That's how I read the Bible. I put myself there. Hey, man. Uh, there's one problem you have, preacher. You, you like the Steelers, and you ought not do that. I mean, if he said that to me, I'm like, oh, Lord. Well, you like the Wolverines. That's a double duty. You're, you're going to hell now for sure. I'd be walking away. Oh, Lord. If he'd tell me to like Ohio State, I'd go to hell. Anyways, so, so anyway, he, he says this to this man. Why? Because it affected him. See, when the Lord gets your heart and when the Lord gives you a little bit of a nudge or a little prick or a little thought that, you know, he's talking to me, that's because he knows you. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what your needs are. What a good God we serve. He doesn't say, hey, this is a rich man having a problem with rich. I'm just going to go ahead and kill him. Not only did he not kill him, he gave him riches. Did he earn those riches on his own? Everything comes from God. So God gave it to him. He was having trouble with it. And God gave him an opportunity as a choice to get rid of the thing that was hindering him from serving God. It wasn't the money that was keeping him from eternal life. It was the love of the money that was stopping him from seeking Jesus in a very real way to get saved. It was stopping him. The money was the thing that was hindering him. Now, as we look through this, and, and again, I, I enjoyed so much going to the conference. And, and again, uh, you should not live your life in a comparison. But I, I enjoyed that. The answer is this. All these things have I observed from my youth. Jesus says, one thing thou lackest. Now, I'm going to submit to you again. There's more things that this man lacked. Are you with me? But the one thing was really hindering him from having a relationship with Christ. Okay? Are you with me so far? As I read this, <clears throat> I started to think about uh, throughout the week. And, and I prepared this on Wednesday of the conference in the afternoon. And, I, and I'm sitting there thinking about Bethel. I was so excited. Uh, I was so excited that these men, first of all... <laughs> Please don't take this wrong. This is, it blesses my heart. First of all, I love that everybody knows my dad. I love that. I love everybody knows Pastor Skyver. It just thrills my heart that he was, he was a he was a preacher that was uh, at the very most a small town preacher, and he built a, built a real nice church there in uh, in on Galena Street and Lighthouse. He, you know, but I'm glad they know him. And you know, all oh, preacher is terrible. It's not terrible. I'm glad. Listen, you need to get some heroes in your life. It's not about an idol worship. It's not that at all. Whose faith follow? I watched my dad for 25 years serve God. He didn't have everything in the whole wide world as assets. He didn't have thousands of people in his church. But bless God, he served God. 
And I was glad that, oh, yeah, your father-in-law, or your dad, he called me my dad, but your dad, we know him. Who are you? <laughs> but that's okay. They know us. There's something to be said for having a good name. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I'd rather have a good name. This man that preaches all across the country said, I want to come to your church. I want to tell you this. With all, I'm standing there, and there's lots of people around that man. He didn't ask them. I almost fell over when he asked me. Sure. I mean, you could, he just preached at the National Sword of the Lord Conference. Thousands of people there. But I heard of you. I don't know how. Except. From him. I don't go out passing out business cards. Greatest church on the planet. You ought to come. I got to thinking about us. A lot of times you can go to those places and get discouraged. Well, we don't run 2,000. Yeah, but we run a great 200. And uh, by the way, we're only in a city of 11,000. Don't panic. Wait till we're running 1,000 in a city of 11,000. A tenth of the people coming to our... Whoa, won't that be wonderful? That'll never happen. Oh, don't you say that. You saying never means it probably will. I sat there and thought for a minute. The man, in all honesty, in my opinion, Jesus throwing him a softball is almost telling him, you know what, you're doing pretty good. Right? Right? I thought about our church. You know what? We're doing pretty good. Jesus, in my opinion, knows our strengths. Number one, he knows my strengths. He knows your strengths. He knows everybody. The Bible teaches, I'm not going to take time to go into this, but the Bible teaches about gifts, spiritual gifts that are given to us. Don't buy in till you only get one. I, I never liked that teaching. Well, some are teachers, some are this, some are, some are more than one. It's a dumb statement to say, I know great teachers that play great piano. What, what, it's, you only get one, sorry, you're going to have to stop playing. Brother Jim, I'm sorry, our guitar lessons are going to have to stop. I can't teach you anymore. <laughs> one thing I could teach him is how to carry it. Anyhow. So he tells him his strengths. The question tells him his strengths. Think about this for a moment. How's your choir, preacher? Amen? Wait, wait. How's your bus ministry, preacher? How's the preaching? <laughs> Sorry about that. How's your King James Bible preacher? I mean, they stood up there and are shouting about the King James Bible. That's normal here. I don't need a conference for that. That's every day. Amen. Good music every day. Do number 11. That's almost every day. How about your deacons preacher? Amen. Good ones. How about your standards preacher? I think we're doing pretty good. How, how, how about, how about uh, uh, worldliness entering your church? We're doing pretty good. Amen? We're not having no rock bands up here. We're not doing any of that. You're not going to have coffee out in the foyer? Hey, listen, emergent church? I didn't even know that existed. Here's what's funny. I, I got my head so far in the sand, I, I just don't get out there that much. Emergent church is the ad addition of things to salvation and, 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 and trying to cater to the younger crowd. I am trying to cater to the younger crowd. I want them to be part of us. Pretty good. And as I watched Jesus helping me, and, and oh my goodness, it did my heart so good. I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody, oh, you should, you should meet my church. Oh boy, you should come. You should see Bethel. Oh boy, what a great church. Awesome. 
I was not sitting there saying, a bunch of dumpy people. <laughs> Is there any churches open anywhere else? I was excited, and I was excited to tell them about the people here. Hey, what's going on in your church? It's great. I do not have a complaint. It's awesome. I'm listening to fellas out there saying, I've got such problems. I'm going to tell you right now, why don't you just eat dirt and die? But I don't know what to tell you. Good Lord, have mercy. The Lord called you to be a preacher. And I'm not saying there's not hard times, but I want you to know how much of a blessing it is uh, to be in a church that loves God, pretty much loves their pastor for the next few minutes. And, uh, and, and I believe that we're going in the right direction. The Lord gave me softballs. He said, hey, here it is. Preacher, boy, that's, you're doing a great job. And, and uh, much as you want. Every person wants to hear approval, right? I mean, all I need approval from is God, but it sure is nice to hear it from somebody else too. And, and well, don't take that wrong. It could be sinful and prideful on my part, but I'm glad when it's noticed. Amen. And it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with you. And I was excited about that. So he tells this man who is, and by the way, this has him looking for eternal life has nothing to do with what I'm going to tell you, but the, the principle is here. The Lord instructs him, what about these commandments? You know them. We do too, right? We know what we're supposed to do, right? We know that we're supposed to have choir and the buses and the music. And bless God, I believe I could plug Miss Rosie and Miss Jolene right in at that big church and they wouldn't miss a beat. I was, <laughs> they played a hymn. I'm going to tell you, I almost came out of my skin. They played Love Lifted Me about one mile an hour. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. And I'm in the row going, very deeply sinking within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard him as Mary cry from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Would you please sing this faster? <laughs> Love didn't lift you, it sunk you in the boat. <laughs> Good Lord. And I'm sitting there excited because, wait, at the very least here, it's woohoo music. Hymns played like they ought to be played. Amen. And so, I, you know, I'm excited. And the Lord's saying, look, preacher, it's doing pretty good. Amen? I'm telling you, I'm excited. But then the Lord does this. One thing thou lackest. One thing. He tells the man his issue. And it, by the way, everybody has one. One thing that's very difficult to let him have. And it's not always the same. So don't look around and say, yeah, those rich people, they're terrible. Your problem is gossip. <laughs> I talked about gossip this morning. Literally, one of the most destructive things we can do. It, it really is. One of the most destructive. If you've got a problem with Brother Jim, go tell him. He'd much rather hear from you than hear from somebody else about him. And by the way, the only time you ever do it, I can't believe I can't get off this. We must have a problem. The only reason people gossip is not because they want to give a truth or whatever about the person they're talking about. Brother Harry, the only reason they talk about somebody else is to make themselves look better than that person to the person they're talking to. There's never a difference. I'm saying never. You're not going to tell truth. Well, bless God. I'm telling the truth right now about this person, so it's not gossip. <laughs> you ever hear the phrase, truth hurts? Hey, listen, I know truths about a lot of people. And you're not going to hear, hear out of my mouth. Why? Because there's truths about me you don't need to hear either. And by the way, if I'm going to talk about Brother Jim to Brother Harry, it's because I want Brother Harry to see me better than Brother Jim. It's not about giving him truth. What it did is hurt his heart. Gossip never makes things better. Ever. Give me a one example. Never. One thing thou lackest is the ability to keep your mouth shut. 
Ooh, boy, it got the amen stop there. You had the good ability to keep your mouth shut on amen, I'll tell you that. I thought I was going to be encouraged. So Jesus tells this man, there's one thing. It's keeping you from believing in me. It's keeping, the question was not, what can I do? The question is, what can I do to inherit eternal life? It wasn't what can I do to be closer. It's what can I do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus knows everything, remember? So Jesus tells him there's one thing that's stopping you from trusting me for eternal life. Why would Jesus answer the question differently? That's the question at hand. He tells him, you've got stuff. And that stuff, and by the way, it finishes off with how hard how hardly shall a rich man enter into heaven? It's not because it's hard. It's still easy. It's hard for them to give up their stuff and trust in him. By the way, you don't have to give up your stuff to trust in him. You have to give up and trust in him. Amen. I, I, I grow weary of people saying you got to be poor to be a Christian. I, I get weary of that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I heard a message all for, for 25, 30 minutes. A fellow say, bless God, if you're poor, it's all right with Christ. That's the truth of it. But you're acting as though people that have money can't be close to Christ. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's not about the stuff. It's about him. Huh, so he says, one thing thou lackest, one thing is keeping you from doing what you should do. I'm glad that Jesus loves us enough to not only show us our strengths, but also to show us our weaknesses. There's things that each and every one of us not only are strong in, but there's things also that we are not so strong in. Amen? It would do you good and me good to realize that there's some things that we need help in. Right? Me too. And what I'm about to preach to you, I'm preaching at me first and foremost. Are you with me? I'm not dogging anybody in here but me. If it falls on us, amen. Right? I know Bethel does many things well, many things. Music, preaching, the Bible, prayer, people. Some of the greatest people in the world are sitting in this room right now. We've been blessed. Amen? We do lack in one thing in my estimation. I want you to go back and look at this. The Bible says, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Wasn't mad at him. Wasn't angry with him. Wasn't terse with him. He loved him. And he loves you and loves me. Amen? And said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now, that is the thing that is stopping him from getting close to God. That's the thing, okay? Again, this is about eternal life, but let's put it in our perspective. There was one thing that this man lacked, But the answer on the other side of the thing is the same for everybody. Now, I want you to notice this. Whatever that thing might be, here's the answer. Jesus behold him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Let's get rid of the thing and then go to this. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. You can insert in the blank whatever you want to put. You can insert whatever part. You can't put music in there. We're pretty good. Can't put Bible in there. We're pretty good. Can't put prayer in there. I believe everybody could do better on prayer, but I believe we do pretty good on prayer. You can't put standards. I believe we do pretty good on standards. You can't uh, put a godly church service. I believe we do pretty good on that. Can't put piano playing. We've got it. What could we put in there? The Bible then says, 
and, uh, and come, take up the cross and follow me. Go away, take care of this problem. I want you to see, go thy way, right? Then the problem, then and come, take up the cross, which he hasn't gone to the cross yet. This is not the same as dying. This is the same as giving. Maybe dying to yourself, but giving to him. He's given this man a chance. A chance to see this is what you're good at. Is that not true? He gave him what he was good at, for goodness sake. Thank God for that, by the way. I'm highly encouraged by this. Because truthfully, I believe we do so many things well uh, that cleaning up on the one thing I think we could do better, I think will be easy. Right? Good night. Everything's in line. Our choir loft is filled. We've got the right hymn books. We got the right piano players. We got the right praying. We've got the right preaching. We got the right Bible. This should not be hard. I mean, listen. The Bible talks about churches having revivals, and the revivals come after this last part. And by the way, it's amazing how often we need revival. No, we need to stop being dead. What is revival? It's coming back to life. I'm sorry, we're not dead here. It's not that we don't need nationwide revival. It's not that we don't need Ravenna-wide revival. We're alive! Is it dead here? I mean, my soul, I don't see anybody dead. I see some that would like to sleep through it, but I don't see anybody dead. Oh, well, preacher, what is it? The Lord says, come, take up the cross, and follow me. Get rid of the thing. Come. Take up the cross and follow me. In the vast majority of what we do, we do very well. I want you to understand that we do lack in one thing in my estimation. Take up the cross and follow me. I find it interesting that the cross had not come yet. I believe in my opinion that the one thing we come short in, out of all of them, all the things we're strong in, I believe the one thing that we could say, and I'm, by the way, don't you look at me and say I'm preaching at you unless I'm preaching at you. I'm preaching at me first. Me first. When it says take up the cross and follow me, what is the one thing that Christ wants us to do more than anything? I'm going to ask you a question because this question got a hold of me. And, and by the way, I'm not interested in numbers. I, could, I couldn't care less. It did, that's not the point. Come and follow me with your thousand people. I, I don't see it in there. I see him dealing with a person. One. Do you see a great crowd there? I see him dealing with one person. So, Brother Jimmy, I allowed him to deal with me. I allowed God. And, and by the way, don't take this lightly. Listen to me now. I allowed God to tell me what one thing I lacked. What, what, and by the way, there's lots of them. Don't, don't, he's coming saying he only lacks in one thing. Well, I followed him a little bit. He lacks in way more than that. Uh, and I, that's a given. But if there was one thing, if there was one thing I believe we could do better at, take up the cross, follow me. He tells Peter, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. 
goal. Teaching others to observe. Goal. Telling others about me. Goal. Give tracts out. Goal. Tell them how wonderful the church that you're sitting in is. Goal. Tell them about my wonderful Savior. Tell them. Jesus got a hold of me in the hotel room on that night and said, Preacher, everything is going well. The church is vibrant. The services are alive. It's old school, old past, except there's one thing that I could say to you, Preacher. I said, there's one thing that we need to deal with. There's one thing that we could be better at. One thing in all these strengths. I find one weakness, and I think it's important that you know what it is. That one thing is go and tell them. Be witnesses of me, both in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the world. Good Lord, have mercy. We're supposed to tell them. When, when you hear a message like this, you really only have a couple of choices. We can put it away. Yeah, I, I heard you. And we can walk out of this building and allow the devil to take that seed that's been planted in everyone. It's, it's, I, I can tell it's getting a little fidgety in here. I can tell it right now. I know it. You know why I can tell it's fidgety? Because I'm fidgety. See, when you throw yourself out here like this, it puts you in an interesting predicament. As the pastor, I'm telling you that the Lord told me one thing I lack is I certainly better back that up because I'm seen. So I'm a little fidgety myself. I'm a little fidgety myself as I'm talking about passing out tracts and telling somebody about it. Well, you're a preacher. You ought to. What's your excuse? Bless God, out of all the things in the whole wide world we're supposed to do, is the one thing that somebody did for us that we won't do in return. Good Lord, Jim sang a song this morning. I'm telling you, I could sense the kid's emotion as he realized that Jesus Christ chose him over all them. And we're having a hard time telling somebody about that. Telling somebody about the good music. Listen to me. Don't you go out and tell the world, well, we're old fashioned. With that look on your face, it looks like you just ate soap. Well, our preacher's a little loud. <laughs> no, your preacher's a lot loud. Because if I'm not a lot loud, everybody's sleeping. I can deal with the few teenagers have been zonked out since the first point. Let me help you a little bit. There's something we've got to do. Oh, Ravenna's a little town. Hogwash. I'm so tired of hearing that. We've only got 11,000. Oh, we only got 11,000. What would you do if you had 11,000 sitting in this room right now? Where would you put them? Lexington has over 300,000 people in Lexington. Brother Fugit's running 2,000. We're better in percentage than that. It's not about that. It's about what news do we have. There's one thing. Help me now. There's one thing. There's one thing that stops us the lack is one thing get rid of that one thing by the way what is it what hinders you can i can i tell you what it is for me can i would you would you still keep me as your pastor if i told you what it is it's alcohol no i'm just kidding uh <laughs> what 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 is that one thing my one thing is time I live on that excuse. I'm just bearing my heart to you. Am I allowed to do that? I'm bearing my heart to you. I, and, and you know what? I, I'd love to agree with you, Miss Marie. I would, I would really love to. Bless God, I'm so busy. I'd love to say that. That's a lie. I am busy. Am I that busy? My thing is probably not the same as your thing. Would you be willing to tell me that you should not tell people about Christ? Would you be willing to look at me and say, no, nah, nah, I really shouldn't tell people about Christ? Everybody knows they should. Tell me amen. amen. Everybody knows they should. I don't believe anybody in here would say, no, preacher, I disagree with that. I'm Calvinist, and I think whoever's going to, by the way, I'm, it's amazing how much Calvinism is running rampant throughout America right now, in your Baptist churches, by the way. 
Calvinism is very simple. It, the one dogged thing that this poor idiot taught was that you don't have to witness to people for them to get saved. If they're going to get saved, Jesus knows. He lives in the elect verse. One verse, oh, God's elect. He knows who's God. God knows everything, you moron. We don't know it, though. How, how do you get over all the go and tell them verses or witness to be witnesses? How do you get over that to say, oh, we don't have to be witnesses? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So I believe that unless you're a Calvinist and dumb, you realize that the Bible is telling us that we should tell them. I don't think anybody would argue that point. So when the young or man comes to him and says, Jesus, to tell me what I need to do. He met with me. And I was ashamed. I'm a preacher. Ah. And I use the simple fact that I'm constantly going. Are you serious? I'm not talking about Saturdays. See, you can go to soul winning or you can be a soul winner. There's a big difference. Having a mind that comes to the realization that those around you are probably going to hell someday should get us to think, you know what, wow, I should probably tell them. Because let's, this young man, say, I, I'm, I'm assuming, if, if he doesn't get told, are you going to let him go to hell? Is hell real? Yeah, yeah it is. Is heaven real? Yeah, it is. Well, boy, that's pretty easy. That's a pretty easy choice, right? I mean, what would you rather do, go to hell or go to heaven? You are so smart. I mean, it, right? Then the Bible goes further and says, you know what? You don't even have to go speaking on your own. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. You take the word of God with you, get your roadmap in Romans. What, what is there really to be afraid of? Oh, wait a minute. I am afraid. Oh, you know what? That's okay. Because your flesh is making you that way. No, no, stay with me now. I still have 10 minutes. I wish it was 10 seconds. <clears throat> the flesh will teach us to not do this. It, it, the flesh hates it. The flesh will stand there and say, Don't go! You're too busy. Don't go. They won't believe you anyhow. Don't go. Nobody listen to you. Don't go. The last person you told looked at you funny. Don't go. <laughs> They're looking at me funny because I'm ugly. It's not about the gospel. Wait a minute. I'm not saying we're doing bad. Matter of fact, I'm excited at how good we're doing. I wonder if the Lord would prick your heart. Help me now. In the midst of all this, go. Get that thing out. Whatever that thing is. I told the Lord, Lord, I promise you I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. There's people going to hell. There's people going to hell, and I can't be worried about getting one piece of lumber in seven seconds or less, so I don't have to tell anybody about you. Hey, by the way, I'm not doing bad things. I, I, busy here and there. The Bible talks about it. There's, there's something wrong with busyness when you can't tell people about him. I told the Lord, you know what, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to look. Who's in front of me? They're an eternal soul too. Would I be willing, boy, think about this. Would I be willing to take a few minutes of my temporal day to try to get somebody an eternal day? Talking to me now. I mean, if this is, if this is getting on you, it, it's because it's needed now. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm yelling at me. Don't you get mad at me. I'm talking to me, so if this affects you, glory to God. Amen? As I sit in wonder about our church, boy, it's beautiful. I mean, I'm looking at all this stuff, and we care enough as a church to make our facility beautiful. We do. I mean, we're not done yet, but we're, we're getting there, and we're really doing it. Amen? 
I've got men that want to come here. We've got good music, good men, good ladies. I mean, we've got good teenagers. We've got good kids. Glory to God, we're going in a good direction. Everything is fine, songs, everything. Bless God. But there is one thing that thou lackest. Whatever that one thing is, get rid of it. And when you come back, Take up the cross and follow me. Following him will make us fishers of men. We have an opportunity. That opportunity has been old-fashioned, local, independent, fundamental, Baptist church that goes out and tells people about how good God is. We do that. I do that. We're going to see something here we haven't seen in a long time. These waters ought not be still for months. Look at me and listen to me. I'm not, I'm not yelling at you. I'm talking to me. These baptismal waters have been still far too long. There should be somebody in there every week. <gasps> every week. Every week, Brother Bobby should be getting soaked. Every, I would love that, by the way. Every week. Why, how's that going to happen? <laughs> you want me to tell you how it's going to happen? Go. Get rid of that thing. And then come. Take up that cross. And follow me. It's simple. <laughs> it's simple. I'm not telling you you have the same issue I have. But some of us have an issue. A lot of us have an issue. Most of us have an issue. All of us have an issue. Take up his cross and follow him. I'm in the same boat with you. Not above you. <laughs> God was telling this to me. I'm just conveying the message to you. Amen. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we're looking forward to having the Lord's Supper tonight. There is no doubt this being a good church, a right church, a godly church. There is no doubt that each one of us sees this. Each one of us understands that there's one thing we lack. And Lord, that's a conscious effort to tell folks. Even the ones that tell people probably would agree that they could tell more. Lord, please help. I don't want to be a mediocre church. I don't want to be a good church. I don't even want to be an above average church. I want to be great. To do that, we have to continue what we're doing, no doubt. Lord, I believe that we're doing a great job. I believe that a lot has been handed down to us. But then again, I believe there's one thing we lack, starting with me, no doubt about it. We lack telling people about you. We lack inviting folks to come. We lack getting people saved, getting people baptized, getting them involved when the Bible says to take up the cross. That's the cross. All the other things are very important, but they pale in comparison to the cross. They pale in comparison to following you. That is first and foremost. Lord, please help. Please help. We want to do it. I, I believe this church wants to do it. I, I know I want to do it. Help me to get rid of that thing. Take up your cross and follow you. Please help. Please help.